All right. All right. Good morning, everyone.
Let's stand for our call to worship this morning, which is from Psalm 148, and it is verse 13. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted, his glory is above the earth and heaven. Let us praise his name together by singing, as we talked about last Sunday, under the influence of the Psalms. And so we're going to sing Psalm 8 together. Please join me. The Lord our Lord majestic is your name throughout the whole wide earth. You display and set your center for the heavens which show your word. From the mouths of infant children you Ah. Uh-huh. 
our pleasure, our responsibility to give ourselves to the Lord and then give ourselves to those in need. In terms of these desires, what's our what's our desire? Is our desire to give ourselves to the Lord? Or is our desire what the world wants us to have is a desire for riches and a desire for the love of money? Uh, first, first Timothy 6.10 is one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. And it says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That love is a foundation root. It's not the root sin, but it's a root of all kinds of evil that make people into evil desires and even to the destruction of their souls. So it's something we need to, we all have it. I'm convinced that everybody who grows up in America is trained to love money. It's just in, in, our, in our American DNA. And it's, and it's deeply sinful and it's at direct odds with, with the, uh, serving the Lord. So let's, let's go to prayer thinking about these things. About how, how we sin against our holy God by not giving ourselves to him first, which manifests itself in not caring about each other, not caring about our neighbors. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God of our salvation, God of the Lord Jesus Christ, our strength, our provider, we come to you today and we confess our sin. But first off, not acknowledging that you indeed have given us everything in Christ Jesus. We confess, Lord, that we have striven for the things of this world, be it money, be it riches, be it whatever instead of striven for you. Give us that desire, Lord, to strive, to strive for you, to strive for holiness, to strive for that holiness without which we will not see you. Convict us, Lord, of our sin of selfishness, of our sin of not caring for each other, of not caring for our neighbors, and of not giving out of our deepest desires. Change our hearts, Lord. Change our hearts that we may desire to please you above all else. Change our hearts that we may desire to give, not just of our money, that we may desire to give abundantly of ourselves. We plead with you, Lord. We plead with you, Lord, to change our hearts that we may be a giving community. We, we, we may meet tangible needs, Father, be it needs of those who need food, be it needs of those who need shelter, be it needs of those who need a pat on the back. Help us, Lord, to serve others and therefore serve yourself. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Now let us take this time to individually confess our sins. Thank you, Father, for hearing our sins. We know, Lord, that you are a God who hears the prayers of your saints and answers them. So we look forward to the how you will answer our prayers that we may serve our brothers in need. In Christ's name, amen. Now hear this assurance of pardon from Ephesians 4. And be kind to one another, and tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. Please stand as we worship the Lord in song and sing, There is a Redeemer.
to the Lord. Let us sing the doxology. Week, 
the prayers. The prayers. Now I hope that, now I hope that this has been fruitful to you. And I'd be interested, I'd be interested to hear from you how Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ by His Spirit has worked within you as you have, as sat, you have under sat under the preaching, preaching of these marks. Today we, Today we continue in thinking about the church and its witness in the world by these marks. And I want to do, and so, I want to do so by considering two main parts, parts of this passage. First, I want to talk about fear. You saw that in, you your, saw passage, that in your passage, right? Well, what is going, well, what on, is going on, there on there with the fear? And then secondly, and then secondly do, we have do we have a nice clear example? Of how, we may of how we may become a community, a community that, that provokes fear in our society. In our society. Now you're really going to really gonna have to listen closely because we use the word fear not in the way, not in the way that is used within this passage. So make sure you're, so make sure you're hearing me. But let's think about those two things, beginning with understanding fear. fear. What we, see here what we see here in this passage, starting in verse 43, is it says, Then fear, then fear came upon every soul, and many, wonders and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. The question that should keep, keep rising before you when you read something like that is what, is what may happen if the church, if the church in, in any era and in any culture, and in any culture lives with those, marks, with those marks that we see on the front of our bulletin. What will happen, what will happen if, the church, if the church moves in the rhythm, in the rhythm of, a church, of a churchly existence and presents, and presents herself as a new creation? And the answer, and the answer that we see in verse 43 is fear, is fear upon, every soul. upon every soul. If you, if you want to think about, think about it, and you, look and you look around in this passage in context and just ask, well, who is it that we're talking about here that feared? Verse 44 seems to isolate believers and what they are doing. And before verse 44, therefore it seems like he's referring to the general society that has been witnessing these things. And so what we must, so say, we is must say is that the society, not necessarily the society of believers at this point, but the society, but the society watching these groups of, groups of people get together devoted to these things continually. continually. That the society, that the society, society on looking, looking the, peculiar the peculiar nature of this church, that they fear. That they fear. Now, now, you know, I've said, you know, I've said this over and over again. We're not just dealing with a, a text. I mean, it's not good, I mean, it's not good enough to just be a scholar of words. You've really got to ask the question, well, what is being revealed here? What is being recorded by Luke that God actually did in the world? The real world. The real world. And what does he continue, and what does he continue to do through each age? What's happening What's happening here? And when, you start and when you start to ask that kind of question, you can start to glue into, well, what kind of fear is God striking in the world when they're on when they're onlookers at the church, a church that's really manifesting the marks? Did they did they strike fear in general society because of the wonders and the signs? That would be that would be the easy answer, wouldn't it? We just said, well, it's because miracles were being done. And miracles are so odd and so supernatural that it, it, it's fearful to be in the face of such things. Now, sure. Now, sure. I mean, how would you deny that fear is created through through the wonders and the signs that were being done within the apostles? But my question is: Is that the only thing that is happening here? The interesting the interesting thing that I see is that Luke is very purposeful in his recording of these events. And the, and the fear comes before, comes before the, the mention of the signs and the wonders. It comes directly, it comes directly after going through all of the marks of the church. Verse 42, Verse 42 that we've been studying, all the marks of the church, and then 43 says, Then fear came upon every soul. And then he goes on, and then he goes on to talk about the signs and the wonders, which surely must have been part of it, but it can't be the whole thing. And therefore, and therefore, it is not right for us to characterize the fear that was in the, was in the society watching the church as a kind of paralyzing horror in the face of the supernatural. 
the fear was, the fear not, was a not a simple, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Because I don't because I don't understand miracles. I don't understand, I don't understand the suspension of natural laws. You know, recently, you know, recently a, tornado a tornado touched down in Edgewater. Everyone realizes that, right? And I was just speaking, I was just with, speaking my with my brother, and uh, yeah, he has a friend who just bought a house in Edgewater. And, and he said that he, said that, he, reported, uh, he reported to him that he was just going about his normal everyday business, and then he looked outside, and all the trees were bent in half, and there was, and there was uh, like uh, debris floating by, like dog houses. <laughs> And in, his and in his heart, because he had just, because he had just purchased this real estate, <laughs> he said, "He said, I'm afraid." I'm afraid. And perhaps, and perhaps there was, there was a, a touch, touch of that, of that kind of fear in this moment in, in the, this recording of Luke. But to be all, but to be all, to be honest, to be with, honest you, with you, is reflect on this, reflect on this passage more and more, you'll find that that's not, that that's not as accurate as we can be. That the fear, that the fear goes beyond that. That there, is a that there is a different kind of fear. Kind of fear. And, you know, it's and you know, it's difficult to get at the kind of fear that we're seeing here, but I'm going to do my best, and I, and I mean, I want to let you know that I'm speaking with pure respect for the Jewish community, as I mentioned, the Hasidic Jewish community at this point as an example of fear. Please listen, Please listen closely to what I'm saying, because I'm not saying that I'm afraid of the Hasidic Jewish community. What I, what I see within the Hasidic Jewish community, however, provokes a fear in those around them. It seems to be closer to the kind of fear that unsettles a person in the face of an unfamiliar reality that they see present within a community, like the Hasidic Jews. And we see this, and we see this beyond, beyond just the Hasidic Jews in other examples, in other examples where, we where we are unsettled in our relationships as modern people to those who, to those who manifest ancient traditions as a regular, as a regular community. So for, example, so for example, this is what I mean. I want you to imagine that you get on the subway with your children or your grandchildren or just some children that you've rounded up from somewhere. You sit, down you sit down, and across from you is an Hasidic Jewish, Jewish man. I want you to tell, me, you to those tell me that those children are not going to stare, going to stare, at, stare at that person, and they're not going to ask you all kinds of questions because of the reality, because of, the reality of, who of who he is. He will be wearing, he will be wearing primarily black. There will be these there will be these little ornaments that come, ornaments that come out from underneath the shirt because he has a special undershirt. There will be there will be a top hat, top hat and out from, top from the top hat, hat down the coming side, down the side will be spiraling sideburns. If you were to if you were to follow him off the subway to his home, you would find that you would find that there is a very special diet which falls under, which falls under the name of kosher. If you were to keep, you were to keep following him through the week, you would find that he does not really follow your calendar. He follows, he follows a whole different timetable time than around. the world around. It is as if, it is as if he has his own world and his own, and his own microcosm. And when you meet, when the, you meet the women, oh, will they be, oh, will they be different? And the things that, and they, the things assume, that they assume and the and things that they take for granted and how they throw, and how they throw parties and the, kind of and the kind of festivals that they have and how they think about, how they think about art. It will all go down, all go down deep. deep. And if you are not and if you are not familiar with them, then you will not. Then you will not know what to do. It will be like it will be like this strange reality floating through what you consider to be the real world. It won't be like it won't be like the reality that you see a ghost. But nevertheless, but nevertheless, it will be unsettling. Now, would they make now would they make you nervous? Like they're going to hurt you? Is that the kind of fear that we're talking about when I bring up the Hasidic Jewish community? No. No, obviously. But what you see, what you in, see their in their existence is a reality that unsettles you into a nervous curiosity, at least, that shows up, that shows up in children and saying, Mommy, Grandma, Grandma why, 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 are side why are his sideburns so long? Why does he wear, why does he wear that, undershirt? that undershirt? 
It's so curious. It's so curious. And I think that there's, I a, think that there's a part of that kind of fear that we see present here in this passage because of the way that Luke has recorded it. This passage teaches us that when the church exists in her churchly existence, her reality provokes the same kind of response in today's world. And that is the kind of, that is the kind of fear that was, present that was present in that general society. The fear of saying, what in the world is going on? Who, who are, these are these people? Why are they, why are they the living the way that live? they live? It's that kind of, it's that kind of fear mixed with other kinds. Now that's the fear, now that's the fear part, part of this passage. And essentially, and essentially what I'm saying is that when we are devoted to the pursuit, the real pursuit of apostolic doctrine, the fellowship, the, fellowship, the worship, and the prayer, God creates a fear within our society, and in that fear we reach our community for Christ in the kind of fear that I'm talking about, not a I'm afraid of seven run. In the ghost or, in the ghost or paranormal kind of afraid. But in, the Hasidic, but in the Hasidic Jewish kind of afraid. I hope you understand. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Really, Christ. Really, Christ put it this way. Our church. Reality Our church reality is called to be so different that we become that we become like lights in a dark world. In a dark world. That's the picture. That's the picture. And I've, tried to and I've tried to impress upon you the peculiar reality of the church through the image of the Hasidic Jewish community. That image of, that image of the Hasidic Jewish community was given to me over a decade, over a decade ago as I, was being as I was being mentored. And I have been reflecting on that image for this whole time, for this whole time as an analogy to the, different to the different reality that the church is to present within this world. And I pray that, I pray that it is hurtful to you also. But you know it would, be, you know, nice it would be nice if we could leave, if we could leave analogies aside analogies and look at real life examples of a Christian community that would provoke, that would provoke fear, fear in the society around it. And that's one of the, and that's one of the beauties of our next point is that we now have a, now have a, a community in verse 43 that will present itself, will present itself verse, 44 verse 44 and 45, I'm sorry, verse 44 and 45, that expresses itself in a churchly existence that provoked that fear. In other words, what, in other words, what would it look like to exist in that reality? If we could see the, we could new, see the new world, the new, heaven, the new heavens and the new earth, what would it look like? Well, you can look at different, well, look at different expressions of that throughout the scriptures because the scriptures layer expression upon expression on top of each other. But here's one. In but here's one in verse 44 and 45. Now all who believed, now, all who believed together, were together and, had all, and had all things in common and sold their and sold their possessions and goods and divided them, and divided them among all as anyone, as anyone had need. There it is. There it is. The churchly existence, the churchly existence of the new reality. God through, God, God through Christ and His Spirit made a community, and He continues to make a community, namely Severn Running B and others. He continues, to make, he continues to make communities who radically take care of each other in their time of need, so much so that it provokes a kind of fear within the surrounding society. Why are they so, Why are they so willing to sacrifice their own interests to help one another? I do not get it. Why are, they willing, Why are they willing to have smaller houses so that they can help other people? That would be a single, that would be a single example. Now I, want to give you a now I want to give you an illustration of this churchly existence from the world, from the world of uh, beekeeping and the world of, and the world of herbalism. I learned, a few, I learned a few years ago that those who, that those who suffer from arthritis as well as, as well as other disabilities which affect your mobility, that they, that they sometimes, sometimes call upon professionals, professionals to show up to their house with bees. With bees. They bring the bees, they bring the bees and, isolate and isolate them on the person's body where there's immobility. They then force the bees to sting that area as a kind of, as a kind of, relief. of relief. Now, I've heard, have, you now I've heard, have you ever heard of that? Some of you are looking at me like, no, I haven't. 
Yeah, it's a real thing. Yeah, it's a real thing out there. I mean, I mean, you know, maybe that's provoking here in Europe. In America. In America. Yeah, they do that in America. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't tried it yet. If you're wondering. Now. Now, this notion is, this notion is not new, however. I, I was just learning as I was reading some stuff on herbal medicine that not only with bee stings, but in the past, folks as a full remedy for immobility and joints used to slap themselves with stinging nettle. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard that? Yes, welcome to the Yes, welcome to the human race. Now, do you know why? Now, do you know why they do this? The, 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 philosophy the philosophy behind it is because when a person is stung, whether it be by a, bee, be by a bee or by a stinging nettle plant, the body detects, the body detects trauma. trauma. The, body the body realizes, the body realizes that, that there is a need, and the immune system, the immune system, system lots sends white lots of white blood cells and other healers to the, to the traumatized site. And the need, and the need for example, and I've read reports, you know, these are all circumstantial. But I've read reports, but I've read reports that the knees, for example, will loosen, will loosen and, the person, and the person can walk very well again. And some major, and some major diseases, major disabilities. Major disabilities. And what I'm telling, and what you, I'm telling you is that is a picture of the church. That's what we see here, That's what we see here on these pages. The church, the church, like white blood cells, white blood cells rush, rush to the person in need. In need. And not just, and not just with possessions and goods. This is just a snapshot of a much larger picture. And they do so, and they do so just as radically. Selling possessions, selling possessions and goods, and goods or whatever the sacrifice, whatever the sacrifice might, be, might be, in order that the traumatized, order that the traumatized site might receive, healing. might receive healing. If you want to put it in, if you want to put it in a word which sounds a little complicated, complicated the, church the church is is compensatory. compensatory. That's another way of saying, That's another way of saying we compensate for each other. For each other. When there is trauma, when there is trauma in one, in one site, site, all that is healthy brings their health to that site to bring healing. great healing. Whatever the need may Whatever be. the need may be. That's the picture that That's the picture that we see here in radical form, in radical form which really should just be the normal existence of the church. It's just radical relative to our world. When you look at the when you look at the early church, they sold their possessions and belongings in order to provide for needs. And as you go through the Book of Acts, you will find only through the grace only through the grace of Jesus Christ that this will even take place across ethnic divides. The need, will not, the need will not just be those who are of the same, who are of the same ethnicity sharing their finances with each other, but something that we, have, something not that really we have not really seen history. before in history. Through Jesus, Christ, through Jesus Christ, ethnic group will share with ethnic group as if they, as were, if they were really brothers and sisters. Let me go a step. Let me go a step further and let you know what's going to happen under the lordship of Jesus Christ. There are, going to there are going to be Jewish men and women and children on the, on the pages that we see here recorded by Luke who lose their families because they choose to follow Jesus Christ. And what will happen is the church will step up from other ethnicities and they will say, we will be your family. And so you will have a, so you will have a Jewish woman that will end up with a Greek mother. And if we were to fast, and if we were to fast today, forward today, you will have a Latino boy with a black father. Because that is what Jesus, because that is what Jesus Christ is doing, bringing all of the races, of the races together. together. Every tongue, every tongue, and tribe, tribe, and nation, meeting each other, meeting each other's needs. Now I cannot think of now I cannot think of a more beautiful vision. So really, so really, whether you are the knee, whether you are the knee, or you are the elbow, or you are the elbow, or wherever you, or wherever are, you trauma, are with your trauma, the church, the church is like blood cells, blood cells that rush to the site. They cross, they cross over, over obstacles such as racial issues, racial issues, and we meet each other, and we meet each other's needs. As family. As family. That is the picture of, that the, is the, picture of the church. That is the, radical that is the radical kingdom of Jesus Christ. Of Jesus Christ.
Now I want you to know, now, that, you to know that, that what we read here on the pages of Acts is not an isolated occurrence. What you are seeing, what you are seeing is just another layer of what has already been revealed to us. What you see, what you here, see here, I really hope that as I've been speaking, you're thinking, wow, this reminds me of the sermon series on Deuteronomy. Because what you are seeing, because what you are seeing here in this passage is the embodiment of the Torah. It is the embodiment, it is the embodiment of the heart of God for his creation. We love God. We love God. And we love our neighbor. And we love our neighbor. What else would that look what like? What else would that look like but helping those who are in need? How many times do you, many see, times do you see within Deuteronomy someone who is in need? And what the community, and what the community should look like, even anticipating needs. We love God and we love, we love, and we love our neighbor, especially those in need. You know, you'll hear you know, you'll hear other authors throughout the scriptures continue to repeat this refrain, this musical repeating melody that goes throughout all of God's revelation. So for example, so for example, can't you think of where James has said this? James chapter one. James chapter one, verse twenty-seven. Pure and pure and undefiled religion before God the Father, God the God the Father is this. To visit orphans to visit orphans and widow widows in their trouble. In their need. You can say in their need. Paul would then Paul would then say, also say, adding and realizing the same layers within the kingdom of God. Let him who stole let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him but rather labor, let him labor, labor working with his hands what is good. Why? Why? That he may have something. That he may have something to give him who has need. Who has need. It is a community. It is a community. Layer upon layer, layer, upon layer revealed in the eternal Christ of a community. Of a community that is for the other. That is for the other. All of these. Tips, all of these tips. All of these teachings are simple layers of the teachings of the, teachings of the eternal Christ. Throughout all of history. Throughout all of history. Moses declared. Moses declared the same thing in the Torah. Because it is a revelation of God's heart, which does not change for His creation. They are the teachings represented and embodied by Christ in the flesh at His table. It is the same teachings, layer upon layer. What do you think? What do you think Christ is doing as He stands on one side of the table and He looks out to a world in need and He says, "Take and eat." He says it because he, he says it because he knows you are in need. And what does he mean? When and what does he mean when he says take and drink? He says that because he, he says that because he knows that you are thirsty. All who are thirsty, all who are thirsty, thirsty come to me, and I will give you all. And I will give you all that you need. And therefore, as and we therefore, as we discussed before, before in a few sermons, sermons ago. We are to be, we are to be a community of the, of the table. We're saying the same, thing, saying the same thing again, but in a different expression. As Christ offers, as Christ offers himself, himself, so too ourselves do we give ourselves to those in need. And here is where John, here is where John gets the opportunity to speak up as he reports the words of Jesus, adding another layer to what it means to be this radical reality in our churchly existence. Listen to this from John 15. You want to know why? You want to know why fear will be provoked in our culture? This is my command. This is my commandment that you want that you want one love one another as I, as I have loved you. Ooh. Ooh. As the centurion, as the centurion looked, looked up, looked up saw, the love, saw the love of Christ and His crucifixion. Tell me, that he tell me that He was not stricken with fear by such a love. And we too are and we too are called to the same to the same churchly existence. Churchly existence. What is our calling? What is our calling? But to carry our crosses. To continue. To continue. Greater love. Greater love has no one than this. Than to lay down. Than to lay down one's life for his friends. For his friends. Christ sends, Christ sends His Spirit to this church. Christ has, Christ sent, his has sent His Spirit to us. To us. The church, the church, by the Spirit, by the Spirit, 
is formed, is into, formed a into a new reality. This reality, this reality, when kept in when step, kept in by, step the by the Spirit, provokes the provokes the washing world into fear. Into fear. It provokes the it provokes the watching world into an unsettled, into an unsettled nervous, settled, nervous attention to our peculiar, to our peculiar and, strange and strange reality. This reality, this reality is done most, most purely and radically helping those who are in need to the point where, you, the point would where you would even give up life. your own life. It is a microcosm, is a microcosm of, the of the Spirit of God's heart as expressed in the Torah. Expressed in the Torah. It is, the pure, it is the pure expression of, the of all of the marks Christ of Christ's church. It is the consummate, it is the consummate meaning, meaning of, the table. of the table. It is what Jesus, it is what Jesus means, means so when he said so famously, they will know that you, are, know that you are my disciples by your love. By your love. And so, and so I have some questions. I have some questions for you. Seeing what you see, seeing what you see here, it being prophesied, it being prophesied the, reality the reality of your existence, who you are, and, who you are your and your identity. Do you know? Do you, you know the needs of those around you? If not, if not, why not? Why not? Will you leave space, Will you leave in, your space in your heart to listen? To listen. Will you leave Will time, you leave time on, your on your calendar to be neighborly? To be neighborly. If you do know, if you do need know the needs of those around you, will you make Will you make sacrifices personal sacrifices to relieve the to need? relieve the need? Will you be a good Will you be a good white blood cell? We live in a world. We live in a world with much misery, with much misery and suffering. If someone if cries, someone out, cries pain, out in pain, will you have the will time, you have the time and attention to hear the, cry to hear the cries of the afflicted? Will you rush? To will you the rush to the scene like a what like a what white blood cell to bring healing? To bring healing. In other words, seven In other words, run, seven run I'm, asking I'm asking you quite seriously, whether it be for each other, be for each other or, for or for our community, will, will you be, you be the, church? the church? Let's pray to our Let's God, pray to our God that, it would be so. that it would be so. Please join me. God and, Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have given, you us, have given, us, given us the great gift of your Son. Of your Son. And, you, Lord Jesus and you, Lord Jesus Christ, you have sent your Spirit that we might, that we might be a witness to your reality, to your reality, the reality of your kingdom, the reality of, the reality of your presence, the reality of, the reality of your rule. Reality of the reality of your love, the reality of your, reality of your judgment, the reality, of, the reality of your justice, the reality of, the reality of your wrath against all evil, the reality, the reality of, your of your unwillingness to give over your creation, to chaos, to chaos. The, reality the reality that you are restoring. That you are restoring. I pray, Lord Jesus, I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you would make us more and more your church. That you would give us your, you heart. Give us your heart. And that we would truly, that we would truly as, you as you have helped us in our need, that we would help others, that we would help others in their need. In their need. Even, at the Even at the expense of our own life and our own finances and our own, finances, and our own, ambitions. And our own ambitions. Lord, I ask that your Lord, I ask that your people would make this their constant prayer. In the name of Jesus. Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand and celebrate what Christ is in fact doing within His people. The only reason why, the only reason why we know about this, and we'll sing, "I love Thy Kingdom, Lord."
Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, into the love of God and into the very, and into the very patience of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.